Hey guys, it's Javier Vidanya, but you can call me Javi. In today's video, I want to talk about something stinky. That's right. You may be in the beginning stages of preparing to buy a house. Maybe you're researching on how it all works and you might be chatting with an uncle, an aunt, a father, a grandma, or maybe a real estate agent with a headshot from the eighties still. And they might give you some advice that sounds like sound, but you might smell Hey, something's some, some, some a little smelly. Listen, everybody comes from good intentions, but let's just be honest here. There's a lot of real estate advice out there that age like milk, and it is just terrible, god-awful, smelly, and yes, it could potentially turn into a delicious cheese, maybe an amazing queso fresco, but for now, when it comes to real estate, we probably want to avoid it at all costs. The first one is buy as much house as you can. This one's a little interesting because, you know, you might already kind of be in the process ready and you'll go and pre-qualify with a lender. Now, this is all very exciting. And the idea is you're thinking that everybody is looking out for you, right? Especially you're thinking, well, these people have licenses. Surely they're not going to put me in a bad position because then I'm going to give them a bad review and they won't refer me. So you talk with the lender, you give them all your information and they call you back a day or two later and they say, congratulations, you pre-qualify for $450,000. And you go, holy crap, I can't believe it. I can buy a $450,000 houses. Now you might already start going on Zillow. Maybe you already have been going on Zillow or any other websites out there and you start kind of browsing $450,000 houses. Or like I said, maybe you're already browsed and you're like, yes, I saw some really nice houses like at $440,000. Let's go look. And now you're finding yourself an agent and now you're going under contract and everything is going smoothly, right? There's nothing wrong with this because they told me I pre-qualify for this amount. That's great, right? Well, not necessarily. This is a very dangerous path to take and it's quite frankly an oxymoron. Now, I don't really know what oxymoron is. I'm just trying to sound smart right now. I wanna make sure I got the definition right. Uh, a contradictory term. Okay, perfect. Yes, it is an oxymoron because real estate or owning your house or buying a house, I should say, is the ultimate act of freedom. You're owning your house. You are the Lord of your land. You no longer have your landlord. But if you follow this path, the opposite will happen. Here's why. There is a huge difference between what you can qualify for versus what you can afford. According to the guidelines that the lenders use to qualify you, they're basing off what you qualify for based off your gross income. And for those that don't know, your gross income is what you earn on paper, but not necessarily where you're taking home. Now, every loan is different, and I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that because there are other videos that do a much better job of doing that. Shout out to Kyle Seagraves, Wind House You Love. So let's use an example here. Uh, let's just say you're doing with an FHA loan, which I think the max allowable DTI is like 43 to 48%, but let's just say like 45% here. So if you're making about $7,500, if you get this number, you multiply it by let's say 45, if you get 45% of that number, you get 3,375. Now from this number, they're gonna subtract any monthly payments you have, like on your debt. Let's say you have a $300 car payment and $100 of, of minimum payments of credit cards. So we subtract 400 from this number and we get about $2,975. So the lender will say, hey, congratulations, you pre-qualify up to a monthly payment of $2,975, which right now, day, nowadays equates to, I don't know, like mid 400s, low 400s, depending on where you live, maybe even 300s. So they'll tell you that and you'll say, hey, you qualify for this, congratulations. And that's where you're gonna go and say, woo, yippee, whoop de doo But there's a big difference here, or a big conundrum, if you will. Once again, me using those fancy words, not really understanding what they mean, but hey, I'm trying here, is you're not actually making $7,500. You're really only bringing home like 75 to 80% of that. So we're gonna leave that 2,975 on the upper right so you can remember that's what they qualified you for. Uh, we get 7,500 and let's say you bring home about 80% of that. You're only bringing home $6,000 take home like that's your actual amount that you're bringing home now if we get 29 whatever that number is, let's just say it's 3000 that means that your monthly payment will be half of what you actually bring home meaning 50 percent of your take-home income is going towards your mortgage payment 
this is not a good position to be in. Now, a lot of people, when they gave this advice, like in the early 2010s, when houses were like $150,000, dollars and people were like, yeah, don't worry, just go. They were doing this because houses were going up tremendously in value. And you put, you got yourself in this position where you could like, you're squeezing by, you can barely make do, but your house is like gaining a lot of equity. And you, next thing you know, you have a hundred to $200,000 of equity in like after five or six years in, in the 2010s. It's not like that anymore at all. On top of that, those monthly payments were like 1200 like 1100 a thousand dollars most people were not having to stretch things out to really get to that point so there was a lot of differences happening here but more importantly we're in, we don't have the, the the ability or flexibility to do that anymore because right now quite frankly as we're going to see with other pieces of real estate advice we are in a really unstable market quite frankly homes are not a, the best investments to make in yourself if you're buying a house it's just for other reasons right now not for investing purposes so what do you do well, you actually base it off what you can actually afford. There's a lot of schools of thought. Um, honestly, you could either just use a calculator or you, there's a lot of resources online. I do have this one on my Patreon if, if you're interested, but you don't have to. You can literally just plot a calculator, do this on your own. So the rules of school, schools of thought here is like you want to be between 20 to 30% of your net home or your take home income. Uh, here we have up to 25% to your net. 30% of your net, 33% of your net. And of course, there's another school of thought out there that people say 28% of your gross. So I plugged in the numbers here, added the $300 a car payment, $100, what was actually a credit card and student loan. Let me add that there. And I have it based off 50% here, which is why it's a little higher. Um, but uh, basically there's, it shows you what you would qualify for. And then it shows you here what your super safe number, 25% of your net income is to your like 33%, which is a third of your take home income. So really you should be buying in this range. Once again, fancy calculators aside, just pull out a calculator, 20% to 30% of your net income. That's where you want to be. But honestly, like try to get that even lower if it's possible. Try to get that under 20%. The second advice is just stinking, smelly, did not age well, is real estate is always a good investment. You can't lose in real estate, they say. Now, this one's interesting because a lot of times it comes from people that have benefited greatly from real estate. It comes actually a lot of times from real estate agents. Yes, I know. Um, why, why would a real estate agent be telling me a real estate is a great investment? Listen, at the end of the day, as a real estate agent, I can tell you there's a lot of bias coming from us. They need to sell a house to make a living. And at the end of the day, when they give you advice about long-term real estate or how they've succeeded in real estate, real estate investors or agents or whatever they are, that's, I mean, they have to indicate what years they bought these real estate investments. Cause I want to see people who are making money now, which is not a lot of them. Only people that have, that are like carrying over those really low rates or carrying over a really cheap house that they bought. Right? So anyways, there's this idea that real estate investment, you can never go wrong. You know, you're, you always gonna make your money back somehow, or sometimes they'll even throw phrases like this real estate markets go up and down. If you hold your house for long term, you'll eventually be at a positive. And listen, I'm not here to tell you what you do with your money. This is your money. And quite frankly, in my early 20s, my mid 20s, I wasn't the best with money. So I'm not the best guy to listen to where to invest it. There's a lot of great resources out there for you to do that. But what I can tell you is that real estate isn't the best investment anymore. Like in the 2010s, it was such an easy, dumb investment to make. Not dumb, but really easy as you didn't need to be smart. You bought a house anywhere and prices just went up and up and up. We're not in that market no more. We are in a very unstable market. And quite frankly, we don't know if prices are going to go up, down, mid. People on YouTube have been saying the housing market's going to crash for the past three years. Real estate agents are saying the market's going to stay great forever. It, at the end of the day, there's just like this battle that's going to go on forever, right? So take a step back and really think about this like with like other things. Um, Right here next to me, I have my baby, my PC that I've been modifying a lot for the last like, you know, six months. And I think there's a lot of similarities with like building a PC or maybe planning a wedding, whatever, some kind of big major event to buying a house. Obviously a house is a lot more expensive, but think about this for a sec. When I decided to build this PC, I said, I'm gonna build this PC. And if there are channels out there saying, oh my gosh, the GPU prices are gonna crash. Like don't buy a PC yet. Don't buy PC parts until you wait for the mark for the GPU to the 40. I think the Nvidia 4090s right now are like 18 or $1,900. Just waiting for them. They're going to crash. There's just no way they can sustain that high price. Now, of course it might make sense if for example, my budget isn't there yet. My budget isn't there to buy the 4090 that I want. My budget's not there to buy the, 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 the CPU that I want or, or the, the case that I want or whatever the case is. Right. Or I want to really save so I can 
buy everything be white or black or whatever the case is. If my budget isn't there yet, then I'm kind of forced to wait. And I can keep an eye on the speculation of what prices are going to happen, but I'm kind of taking a, a backseat. I'm keeping an eyes on things because quite frankly, I'm still preparing, right? But at the end of the day, I'm using this as a as an example. Hopefully you're following along. My budget's ready and I've saved enough to buy all my parts. And yeah, I could wait a few months to see if the prices drop or anything. But I'm, I'm, I'm invested and I'm doing this. I'm buying the CP and I'm building it and now I'm happy. I didn't go into debt in doing it. I didn't buy a credit. I didn't put it all on a credit card. I didn't ask my dad for money or my mom for money. I just, I saved my money the old fashioned way and I got it. Now let's look at this into the house. You might be in a position where you're forced to wait and you're like, oh, I can't, the market, yeah, this is too crazy. I'm, and that's not, that's okay. As long as you continue to prepare, save your money, build your credit, put yourself in a positive position where you're gonna come with authority when you're ready to buy and say, I have this amount of money and this is, I need the lenders to give me a great deal because I'm a great buyer. But if you are in a, you find yourself in a position where you are ready to buy, you have the credit, you have not only the down payment, but you have the emergency savings, you have already, your additional investments are already started, your retirement is already started, you're in an excellent position to buy, and in your area, it seems like you can buy within your budget, meaning that you are you can buy what you can afford and not what you can qualify for, but you don't wanna pull the trigger because the market's gonna crash, or it's not a great investment anymore. Like, you need to have a tremendous why. Like, your why needs to be so strong that in the face of scrutiny, in the face of people saying you're the dumbest person for buying a house right now, you're like, yeah, I'm buying for this reason. Now, for a lot of people, that reason was financial. Like, well, I don't really want to buy right now, but I mean, it's a good investment. And I know I made a bunch of money on it. That's not going to work anymore. You have to be, I want, I want a yard where uh, my kids can go run and I actually want to own the yard. I don't want to, if someone to tell me what I can do or can't do with it. I want to be able to f have full ownership of where I live. Now, some of you guys don't get this, but a lot of you get, let me know, please, if you do get this. Um, having a landlord or moving every one or two years sucks. It really sucks. And you don't think it's not bad until you find one that's just straight from hell and it just completely ruins your life. And you might experience that one or two times before you realize, you know what? I want to own where I live. I don't want to deal with this anymore. That's a why. Um, whatever your why is, it can't be money per reason, like investment purposes, like, oh, I want to make a bunch of money like my cousin Edgar did, or I want to, no, that's not going to make sense anymore. So focus on what you can control, your budget, your savings. And if you're, if you're in a market that's just really expensive, my heart goes out to you, unless you, you can start exploring different options and whatnot, or moving and whatnot, but you know that already, you're having those conversations. But if you continue to look and see what's going on with the market, is the market crashing? Are the prices going to drop? Oh gosh, and that's preventing you from actually committing to it. Then your why isn't strong enough. If I continue to look at the prices of the CPU and GPUs and everything and like, oh, I'm just going to wait for the price, even though I have the savings ready to go, I'm just going to wait for this, the certain GPU to drop down to, you know, 1200. I just, I don't want to spend 1900 on it. Okay. Then I didn't have a strong why. You know, I'm just trying to snap you guys out of like the, the, the whole like spiral effect of like, hyper focusing on the investment side or the market crash side of things because at the end of the day tell yourself this is going to be a really bad investment just be honest with yourself is this a investment and if you're still like but i'm still buying for this reason then you're ready but anyways now let's go to the last stinky smelly advice that age like milk interest rates can only go down so buy the house now refinance later or you might hear date the rate marry the house now I just recently made a video about this in my red flags video. Um, and you're going to hear me repeat this a lot of times in multiple videos, but quite frankly, it's because I really strongly believe in this. And a lot of lenders are getting on my, my butt about it because they think it's a really dumb idea to buy down the rate and do all this when interest rates are guaranteed to drop. Yet, even though everybody was so gun ho about rates dropping this year, the recent announcements with the inflation rates, those drops aren't happening till like midway point of the year. And they're going to just, what? We're we just going to continue to trust the government to give us the better rate. They're going to just keep pushing the goalposts further out and further out. And what people are going to tell you is two things. They're going to tell you, uh, just don't worry about the rate that's high right now. Just just, just buy it and then you'll we'll refinance down the road. Don't worry about it. Um, or they might tell you, hey, don't like if you're getting extra seller's concessions or you, if you find yourself in a position where you have that extra cash to buy down the rate. Um, you're like, don't do that. That's so dumb. Like, just wait. At the end of the day, it's your money, right? And me personally, personally experienced, not, not the real estate agent Javier, not talking about the real estate content creator Javier. I'm talking about Javier Vidaña, Javier Enrique Vidaña. 
the boy who did you guys see this by the way let me see if i can focus in on that i can't shout out if, if you can say what that is blurred out in the comment section you're gonna get a, a a kiss from me a digital kiss i want to get the rate where i'm comfortable for the next 30 years i don't want to rely on external forces meaning the, the rates are gonna drop or whatever to be happy i want to buy a rate that's gonna that i'm like you know what javier this is the rate I'm stuck with for the rest of my life. And that's it. If the rates are too high right now, and even like seven, seven and a half, eight percent, whatever they are, and you're like, and, and no one's giving you anything extra to, to get that rate lower by buying either a new build or getting some kind of seller's concessions or lender credits or something, you're like, okay, well, I'm not buying. And the lender might go, whoa, well, hold on, Javier, you can actually, you're the, you could just refinance down the road. But, you know, I've seen these stupid TikToks of the, or reels from, from realtors are like, like with these freaking like chins and mewing, like, it's a, 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 if you didn't buy a house this year, you know, while rates are high in three years, the prices are going to be like double and the rates are, you're, you're going to miss out on this equity. That's so dumb. That's just so dumb. There's no guarantee of that, right? So I don't know what ha was going to happen with interest rates. No one knows what's going to happen with interest rates. Everyone keeps trying to predict what's going to happen with it. If you are in the market to buy now and you're buying, do what's best for you now and buy yourself in a position where you're going to be there for 30 years. And guess what? If you're living in it and your lenders will call you when that time comes, but if rates drop like a point lower than what you have, then refinance, sure. And yes, there is a chance that if you, let's say, invested five or $10,000 into buying down your rate and you got like, I don't know, 5.5 or something and rates magically drop down to four and a half. You're like, oh, I just wasted $10,000. Why didn't I just wait? Then you roll the dice and you lost. You're an adult. It happens. But let's be honest. Look at the rate history for the past few years. What's going to happen with it? I don't know. You tell me they're going to drop all the way to four and a half again or five and a half. I don't know. My advice is get yourself the position that you're going to be comfortable with for the rest of your life. Don't buy a house thinking, oh, I'm just going to refinance in a year and I'll be okay. I'm going to really just stretch out my budget now, but I'm refinancing a year from now. That's okay. You're setting yourself up for failure. And I'm talking to you from personal experience. Do not trust these lenders. Like get yourself in the best position now. Shout out to my boy, Lucas, who to like even after post inspection had these lenders fighting for his business and <laughs> somehow got the same like value got the, the whatever it was costing to get that right where they wanted to got the cost cut in half for the same amount of value we need that they were even able to they, he finagled these lenders he made them work for this business and he got it done and quite frankly he's gonna get himself a rate that's gonna be really soft sweet and if rates drop way below like a few years from now he got his money's worth, right? He's not waiting around for rates to drop. He's in a good spot. Quite frankly, should he even refinance or should he just, just keep living his, doing his thing? You know what I mean? Do what you can. Control what you can't control. Control your budget. Control your savings. Get yourself in a position where you're buying a house. So you can you have the ability to make extra payments or you're in a position where you have the ability to create build on your other investments. You have that additional funds. You're not just having everything tied up to the house. So you're living a life where you're in control, my friends. So what do you guys think? I'm excited to see what kind of good stuff you got in the comment section. If you want to be part of the Home Goal Homies, check out our Discord channel. We also have a Patreon with like a bunch of goodies. I will be releasing a new project on my Patreon where I'm going to be talking about like real life home buyer scenarios. I can't really give that here on this platform because it's like too big. But for people that join the Patreon, I'm just going to be talking about like maybe once or twice a month, just doing a podcast with me, just chatting with people. Thank you guys so much. YouTube thinks you should watch this video next. Go check it out. Appreciate your guys' time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.